good morning, everybody. It's so good to be here. I'd like to thank you for patiently waiting for me. There was a little um, uh, um, mix up somewhere. But so good to be here. I'm happy that God brought us this far, another year together. It's been years coming, and by God's grace, we would have many more years of of growth and progress in the faith together. Good morning, Pastor Emisi. I'm not sure if she's on the call, but good morning to Pastor Emisi. Good morning to Bishop. Good morning to um everyone in the team, all the team leaders. Good morning to every member who I'm friends with, you know, uh, from a distance or somehow. And every other person who I'm, I'm, you know, acquainted with, God bless you. I'm amazed. I'm, 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 I'm glad that God has been giving us an amazing time here at um, Rufiol. It's been an amazing time. I believe that all the speakers have been blessing us. And um, this morning, we're, we're not about to have something different because um, it's always from glory to glory with God. Um, Bishop Polo, good morning. I can see you. I, I, I propose to... To, to say hello to you. All right, this morning we're going to go into God's word. I have a couple of minutes to do that. I'm, I'm gladly, I'm gladly, and and uh, I'm, I'm coming back tomorrow with the privilege of sharing God's word. I'd like to thank Pastor Missy, my dear sister and friend, one more time, and Bishop for the, uh, you know, the give me the sharing the, the privilege of sharing God's word with God's people here. All right, this morning I have a special, I have a message from God and I would like to ask if you can see me and hear me clearly so that I can proceed if this is good enough for you or you so, you can, so that I can proceed. All right, praise God. Thank you for your feedback. I am going to start from... Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm going to start. Very interesting subject. Very in interesting subject this morning. You know, we've, we there's we have we have learned several subjects in Scripture, several subjects in Scripture that has propelled us forward, but Sometimes God will have to bring us back to some portion of scriptures that are priorities in our faith and our walk. I've been here um, a couple of times, and I remember, was it last year or two years ago, I shared with us how we should evaluate our year. Refre refill is always coming up toward the end of the year, and it's important that we know how to evaluate our year. Now, that's not my subject right now, but I just want to uh, talk about it because it came to my spirit to, you know, put that forward also. How to know if you've had a great year. So as you look forward to what, as you look toward the end of the year, look forward to ending the year, there, there's a scripture or way to evaluate your year to know how your year has been. All right. If you know, if you know how, if you, um, how to know if you've done well this year, or how to know how to end well this year. First one is, um, as Christians, we must evaluate ourselves by number one. If we had a good year, we know if we had a good year by number one. Um, if the knowledge, if we are growing, or if we have grown in the knowledge of Christ, that's the first one. If we have grown in the knowledge of Christ from January up until now, how has it been in your knowledge of Jesus Christ? The scriptures tell us to grow in the knowledge, in grace and the knowledge of Christ. Number two, you're grown in the stature of Christ. That is to say that there's a corresponding or there is evident increase in your stature as a Christian. Spiritually, you're now more like Jesus. You think more like Jesus. You talk more like him and that you have the fruit of the spirit more evident in your life. And number three, you are, how well are you in sync with God's plan and purpose for your life? Because 
Megalic device is at the counsel of a man, all right? But the Bible says that um, the answer of the tongue is of the Lord. Many people have plans of how their year would have been or how their year should go. And many a times people, interestingly, you can succeed at what is not God's will for your life. And um, it's that's why it's very important to always evaluate yourself, always know what God's, God's plan for your life is. And, you know, you stay there, follow God's plan thoroughly, because that's how you will be judged. And that's how you'll be evaluated by God. You might have the praise of men and not have the praise of God, but it's always good to go for the praise of God, because that's how we are finally you know, that's why that's how we are ultimately evaluated. And number four, you know, if you have a good year, if you have certain good things, you can count. Interestingly, people start from number four, looking for good things they can count, the, the cars, the houses, jobs, the new jobs, the you know, all those things are very amazing. They are wonderful. It is God's will for you to have those things. But that those are not the primary material increase, is not the primary way to know if you've had a good year. It's God's will. All right. However, it's not the ultimate. It's the last on the list. The three, the four, the three previous ones are the most important. Your increase in the knowledge of Christ, your increase in the stature of Christ, and your character must be better. You know, at the end of this year, you should know you should be walking in the car in the in, you know in um in walking in the in the spirit, as as the Bible tells us too. And number number three, you are aligned with the will of God for you. And then we can go into the other ones or the material blessings that you may have. Praise God. Now, let's go to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. This morning, I'll be sharing on a very important subject by the Spirit of God. As I was waiting on the Lord for what to share, um, he brought these words to my spirit, and I will share them. I will share them. One of the greatest teachings of the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, uh, one of the greatest expository teaching of the Lord Jesus is in Matthew chapter 5. You know, Jesus, the Lord came and he said certain words that are amazing. I think I will just go straight. Yeah, he came to bring and expound, expose and expound the teachings of of Moses, you know, he he is the revelation of the teachings of Moses and the understanding of the teachings of Moses, right? So I'll continue to share with you from Matthew chapter five. That that's why he said, "I did not come to destroy the law, but I've come to fulfill it." The word "fulfill it" there means bring it to life. Bring it to light. Start. So in Matthew 5, we know, we, we, we read what we know as the Beatitudes, but it doesn't end in all those blessed that blessed that. He went on to teach about other things, about, you know, how to live. You know, the very intentions of Moses when he, he instructed the people on how to live. All right. Now, let's look at something in verse 22. He said, but say I unto you that Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say unto his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell and fire. Therefore, if you bring, therefore, if you bring thy gifts to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother has ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way first. Be, go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Interesting. See the mindset. Look at the heart of God the Father. He said, if you bring a gift to me, and you remember that you have issues to resolve with your brother. Leave the gift and go to your brother and resolve the gift. So to God, your offering and your worship isn't complete when you're not walking in love. 
your offering, your service, your ministry, whatever you call it, is not complete if you are not walking in love. God is more concerned about the state of your heart than the content of your hand. We, we emphasize service, and that's because in the kingdom, you are born to serve. You are, you are a son of God who is serving the king. You are king servant. However, the quality of our work is as important or more important than the work itself. So I'm bringing to you a subject that will inspire you by the spirit of God to, you know, bring that which is quality to God all the days of your life. You know, bring that which is quality to God all the days of your life. The Lord Jesus said, if you bring your gift to the altar, you're ready to worship. You are ready to serve. You are ready to minister to God. And you remember. Don't act like you didn't remember. You know, because God knows when you remember something. Because many a times, the Holy Spirit is the one who will bring it to your remembrance. You remember that your brother has something against you. Interestingly, the, the, rope, the stakes are higher in the New Testament. He said, he didn't say if you have something against your brother. He said, you remember there's an issue your brother has against you. Go and resolve it. Then come back and drop your offering, your gift. Very important. So your worship isn't complete when your love walk is tampered with. Because God looks at the state of your heart. We are living in a generation that we need to be conscious of the words of Jesus more than before. The scriptures tell us explicitly in the last days the things that will happen. As we are refueling, God is adding to, I, I know we've heard that, all the amazing teachings that, you know, have blessed us and the ones that will come after me, amazing, I salute and celebrate what God did and what God will do. And what God is doing. But add this to what you know. That without love. You are nothing. A word of God. A, a, a message. A, a, the spirit of God gave me a message. Not too long ago. Sometime last year. As I was preparing for this year. And we would usually fast and pray. As a church. We would fast and pray. And then the words of the Lord will come to us. And prophetic words at times um, all the time and the lord said i believe it was last year or early this year or sometime that a storm was coming and the storm will be a storm of a wind was coming a wind was coming i was ministering and the word just broke out a strong wind was coming he said two things characterize the wind. Number one, the wind of offense. And number two, the wind of deception. This was sometime last year, I remember. The wind of offense and the wind of deception. It's, it's in the scripture. But the Lord was tugging our hearts at the realities of what we were about to begin to experience in the body of Christ. Indeed, this year, more than ever before, there, there was a strong wind of offense that broke into the space, the air space, the ground space, and a strong wind of deception. Of course, the Spirit of God has updated that prophecy or that word, and we have been walking by that. We've been able to guard our heart by scriptures of the people have been taught God's word, and that's why by the grace of God, we're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and all that. So there was a strong wind of offense and we talked about the strong wind of deception, these two things. Now, let's talk about the strong wind of, wind of deceptions. We see a lot of people walking in offense today because they are not, on, they are not, they are not, they are ignorant rather of the devices of the devil. The, the journey is far. When God is taking you is very far. The devil is aware of the destination. That is why he throws in your path hurdles and hindrances. 
the greatest hurdle you will ever face as a Christian is not the lack of money. It is not the lack of a job. The greatest hurdle you will ever face, the greatest temptation you will ever meet is your temptation of offense. Offense is the killer of destiny. And that is why Satan throws it your way. Offense will pollute the heart of a man. Offense will pollute the gift of a man. Because when the heart of a man is polluted, the gift will be polluted, corrupted. Because God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. Today, it seems as though people are more at loggerhead than ever before. Nation against nation. People against na people. Brethren against brethren. Brethren against God. Brethren against the devil. I mean, that's even good anyway. Brethren against, you see, all sorts of, um, of conflicts are going on. You don't have to be. Jesus, the Lord Jesus said, offense must come, but woe to the man by which it comes. The greatest thing you must guard in this season and in the seasons to come is your heart. You guard your heart against offense because the determining factor for the evaluation of anything you will ever do for God or anything God would ever accept as good is love. So I'm talking about guarding your love walk. Guarding, guarding, that is to guard, G-U-A-R-D. Guarding your love walk as you advance in the course of life. That is what I'm sharing. Guarding your love walk as you advance in the course of life. If you are a pastor, you understand this. One of the greatest challenges and the greatest temptations you would ever face is in the area of love. If you are a member of a church, a leader, you, you see, you're, you're, you're a career person, you go to the office, Everywhere it seems as though there's just something manned against you to bring you down. Now, a lot of people think that, oh, when we talk about love work, it's impossible to be offended. Let me tell you something. The answer, Pastor, is it possible to, to be on, on, is it possible to live above offense? The answer is absolutely yes. Now, I'm sharing the things that I, I've seen in the scriptures and by the grace of God, we know it's possible. It is possible to live above offense. Is it possible to prevent offense? The answer is no. Offense must come, but it is possible not to be trapped in offense. Let me show you something in scripture so you know the power of this thing we are talking about, your love walk. You know, the Bible says there are three eternal things faith, hope, and love. And it says the greatest of them is love. It says love never fails. Love never fails. So you can be big on the subject of faith. You can be a champion in the use of your faith. But if you do not walk in love, your faith is nothing. Because the Bible even tells us that faith worketh by love. It seems as though everything is dependent on the subject of love because God is love. That is why but love is not an emotion and love is not a principle alone. Love is a person. It is God. It is the force that created the whole earth. Are you following here? So you must understand listen, that the reason why offense comes is so that you will walk out of love. And once you walk out of love, you are walking in a dangerous zone. It's a dangerous zone. The greatest, the most dangerous zone a Christian can walk in is in offense. There are some of you listening to me now. You need to go back to your office. As you get to your office, you need to enact or act, um, uh, initiate reconciliation with someone. Reinitiate reconciliation. You are listening to me right now. You've been praying for a miracle, trusting God trying to release your faith. You are, you are about to shake the coat apart. You're binding and casting. Meanwhile, the major hindrance to your prayer is in your heart. 
not God, not even the devil. But it's that thing called offense. Some of you need to reconcile with your in-laws. Now, I'm going to talk about the wisdom of love tomorrow. And I'm going to share with you practically how you can be as wise as serpents and gentle as doves. How you can live in the world full of offense and not live in offense. And you can practically know how to prevent yourself from falling into the trap. Prevent offense from coming where you can't prevent it. And manage it where you cannot prevent it from coming. But today, let's talk about <clears throat> your love walk, our love walk. John's Gospel, St. John's Gospel, that's First John chapter 1. Uh, no, first John chapter 2, all right, and um, what is love very important? Number one, because love is God. Love is God. That's why love is important because, number one, love is God. And God is important, so God is love and love is God. Number two, love is important because it is a commandment that Jesus left us. The Lord Jesus came and summarized all the commandments of Moses and said that this law of Moses, the commandments, the 10 commandments that we know are summarized into two. Love your neighbor and love, lo he said, no, two. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So the commandments of Moses are not abolished in the sense of done away with useless, but Jesus came to throw light on that commandment and said the purpose of that commandment is to drive people to love but they did not have the capacity because they were not born again they were not they didn't have the nature of god in them now if you are born again you have the nature of god in you the bible says in romans 5 5 that the love of god has been shed abroad in your heart listen brother listen sister you have the capacity to love and to walk in love all right you have the capacity to love walk in love it's now part of your nature. Stop saying things like, you know, um, I'm a very tough person. I'm very hard to please. Stop talking like that. Your father in heaven doesn't talk like that. Don't forget, I mentioned that if you are going to have, if you are going to evaluate your year as a good year, one of the things you must find in that year is that you, one of the things you must find in that year is that your character, your, your the fruits of the spirit are evident. You can't be you can't be a charismatic Christian without character. You will make a mess of the image of who you represent. So the nature of God is in you. We can walk in love. There is no offense we cannot forgive. Listen, it may be tough on the flesh. This is what the Bible tells us not to walk in the flesh. It can be tough. Is it to be there? Times we have been hurt so bad. Listen to me. The Lord is bringing healing this morning to certain of you. There are some people who are hurt so bad. It just took God for you not to make some nasty decisions. And you listen, we understand. God understands. That is why you are now a new creation. The life of not being the flesh. You, you, you're holding the grudges against your in-laws. I understand they're not nice people, but greater is he that is in you. The, the, this world is a supernatural, it's a spiritual world. We have a lot of forces, both good and evil. Understand this. This world is not um, what we call, it's not, as, it's not as plain as black and white. There are gray areas also. So you must be spiritually discerning. You realize sometimes that somebody who you trusted the most was the one who came against you. The, the, that is the one who came against you. And that means then you lost the ability to trust. But the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that love trust. Some pastors are now tough people. They are now very harsh people. The pastors find it difficult to, to embrace people again because of what they've been through. Same with some of you, and find it difficult to embrace leadership. But there is no good enough excuse 
to embrace offense. I will show you in scripture. The greatest downfall of a Christian is in offense. You can win. If you do not win in your love work, you have lost it all. The loser in the kingdom is not the one who has not healed the sick or raised the dead, but the one who has not forgiven his brother. And the one who is not walking in love. The love is a commandment of scripture. Love is not a suggestion of Jesus. It is a command of the master. It is not the suggestion to have no opinion when it comes to the commandment of the master. Interestingly, when he says love, he's not telling us to do what we cannot do because the Bible says the commandments of God are not grievous. They are not burning storm in there before when it, in excruciating pain of betrayal. Listen, you also may have done things that have hurt people before. You will have but they forgave you. The Lord Jesus told me, the Spirit of the Lord ministered to my I'm still going to read First John 2, but I'm just sharing in my heart. Um, a while ago, he said the, the emblem of Christianity is not the logo of your church. The emblem of your Christianity is not the logo of your church. The emblem of Christianity is love. He said, by this they shall know that you are my disciple. Not when you raise the dead or heal the sick alone. He says, by this you shall know you belong to me. When you love one another. That's why it's an irony for Christians to fight each other on social media and all that. The emblem of Christianity is love. And I'm going to share with you First John chapter 2 from verse... Um, uh, from verse 5 now. He says, But whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that said he abided in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. So he's saying here, if you say you have Jesus, I've got Jesus in my heart. You have Jesus. He says you will walk as he walked. Amen. So, brethren, I write you no new commandment. I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. So he's talking about love here. He says, love is that commandment which you have from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have had from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you. Which things is true in him and in you because the darkness is past. Somebody shout hallelujah. Say this to me, the darkness is past. You are no longer in the dark. The darkness is past. This is for somebody listening to me. They meant it for evil, but God is turning it, turning it around for your good. He meant it for your downfall, but greater is he that is in you, and he's going to use it for your good. Love is the key to victory. Love is the key. He, the success, love is the ultimate success of the kingdom. Hallelujah. The darkness is past. But who thinks he can throw shade on your name, who can bring you down, hasn't met with Jesus. Because the greater one in you, make sure that no darkness can, can lay hold of your life. Because the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. The true light now shineth. He that seeth, he is in the light. He now watch this, everybody. Watch this, everybody. Why are several Christians attacked? They are praying, they are fasting, they are worshiping, they are committed in their local churches, or committed to philanthropy, committed to whatever. And yet it seems like they are in darkness. He says, He that seeth is in the light and hateth his brother. Is in darkness even until now, meaning there is the litmus test for eternal life in a man is love in that man. This simple, tangible love. As a Christian, you can't be saying things like, I hate that guy. You hate somebody. You cannot use certain words as a Christian. 
because they don't exist in you. You don't have the capacity anymore. Glory to God. As I speak now, somebody is receiving capacity and enablement to walk in a greater dimension of love in the name of Jesus. He that hated his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness even... Uh, uh, let me... Uh, excuse me. Verse 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there is no occasion of stumbling in him. Look this. Look at this. Look at this, everybody. Verse 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. So to live in an atmosphere of light, to walk in love, he says there is no occasion of stumbling in him. He doesn't say there's no occasion of stumbling around him. Occasion of stumbling will be around. But occasion of stumbling doesn't have to be inside you. What trips a man, what causes a man to fall is not around him. It is always inside of him. So you find out some people, they are trying to advance in life. They're trying to make progress in life, but they keep falling and stumbling. Why? Because of this light is not in them. The Bible says if you walk in love, there is no occasion of stumbling. So one of the ways you can stumble, prove yourself, is to ensure that you are conscious of the love of God in your heart. Sometimes you've got to let go. It is not every time you have to reply. It is not every time you have to answer that person. It is not everything you want to clarify. Sometimes you have to let things go so that you don't have to listen but slow to speak. Don't forget, the Bible says anger walketh not the righteousness of God. You see that? That walketh not the righteousness of God. It's not every post you reply. It's not every comment you reply. It's not every status that talks about you. It's not The world does not revolve around you like that. Let me tell you something. The reason why people walk in offense, there are about four reasons and you want to hear it. Number one, you overrate yourself. The Bible says in Romans chapter, two, chapter 12 and verse 3, let no man think more highly of himself than he ought to to say don't think highly of yourself but it says not more highly for people who are it's all about them and selfishness or self-centeredness is actually the, the, the core of sin self-centeredness some people are always about them always about them did you see how did you see how he greeted me 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 you see don't you know that I am the CEO? Don't you know I am the entrepreneur extraordinaire? Don't you know I'm the most celebrated on TikTok? Don't you know I am the firstborn? Don't you know? Don't you know? Don't you know? It's about me, 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 me. The first reason why people are easily, easily offended is because number one, they overrate themselves. And that's what the Bible tells us not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. Paul said, I magnify my office. There's a room, there's a place for that. Barasso Kobaaka, Eshtalima Kobreda, people who are plagued with a sense of superiority complex right now receive revelation, light, and the power of the Spirit breaks that complex. When you begin to see yourself as Christ sees you, some of you need to come to a place where you are content with the commendation of God above the commendation of men. Some people feed on men's validation. They feel that they are nobody until men validate them, so they are easily offended when people don't applaud them. Let me tell you, somebody listening to me, the reason why sometimes up till now, you don't get the applaud you deserve. Now, what's the word deserve? It's because God may be bringing your attention to something. That's your, 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 your value. The quality of your personality is not in the applause of men. It's not in the applause of men, but in the word of God. So sometimes you find out you walk you walk into an auditorium and they, they put you in the back seat. And you are angry. Don't they know in my church I sit right there on the on the stage? I mean, from the altar. Now listen, God would have to train you. He will bring you down your high horses. 
you're overrating yourself. Overrating yourself. Don't you know who I am? Yeah. When you begin to say that you're overrating yourself, everybody has a tendency to always feel maligned. Every one of us. But I learned something a while ago that many of them, and then until I came to that place of revelation of that thing, it was always it's sometimes a battle that when you are overlooked, it is actually God looking at you to bring your attention to something that your eyes may be fixed on the wrong thing. So your overlooked situation may not be that you are not an important person. But God is bringing your attention to another level or another kind of importance. That even in the back seat, you are somebody. Have you, have you walked in such a level of revelation that you are the righteousness of God and you have the hand of God on your life? And that is why I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, do not joke with your fellowship with God because that is where self-esteem is built. But God will tell you things that no man can tell you. God will give you words that will be forever in your spirit. Imagine just coming out of one hour of prayer. Then, you know, you're full of the Holy Ghost. You are pumped, you know. You just heard God tell you the greater one lives on your inside. You just heard God tell you that you are his righteousness. He loves you. You just heard God show you a glimpse of your future. You are excited. You walk into a room full of people and they say, please sit at the back. It's not in any way going to affect you because you may be sitting at the back, but right there in God's plan, you are sitting on his throne. Hallelujah. The mindset. It doesn't come cheap. It comes by the word of God. It comes by spending time with God. Number two reason why people are easily, easily offended because they overrate people. Now, I'm not saying we don't expect the best from people. The Bible tells us to expect the best from people. You see that? That's how we should live in, in a community where people are doing the right thing. But when we overrate people, it means that we do not expect people to make mistakes. I'm not saying this is a license to being foolish all the days of your life, or I be foolish all the days of my life. No, there's room for improvement. There's room for mistakes. But listen to me, room is time bound. We can't just keep living anyhow, thinking that people ought to understand me and all that. People will just move past the person. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying when we overrate our others, you know, we've placed the position, we place them in the position of God. And so we get easily offended when people, you know, switch or whatever. And that's why tomorrow, by God's grace, I'll be teaching on the subject the wisdom of love. How that you can work with people with the best of your heart. And when they disappoint you, you've come to a place where God is still God and God is still God. Number three reason why people get easily offended. You want to hear it. Number three. And that, you know, I said number two because I was going to quote the scripture or I would like to quote the scripture. Jesus, the Lord Jesus said that he knew the heart of men. He knew their heart. He said he did not, he said, he knew they were healing him, they were praising him, but he knew their heart. Today, people are, hey, tomorrow, some of you who are seeking fame and your, your goal is to be famous, you better understand that there's a difference between fans and true lovers. There's a difference between fans and family. You can have 10,000, you can have a million following on Instagram, TikTok, and all the talks, but you have just two real people in your life. So if you seek the validation of men or you place so much emphasis on human beings, you will be disappointed, not because people are bad or you live in such a way that you don't think people can be good. And that's why I want to tell you, if you find the right people in your life, value and cherish them. The right people, sometimes we are looking for the right, we are looking for the right things in the wrong places. We are looking for the living amongst the dead. Sometimes you are reaching out to the high and mighty, in quotes, and they, they shun you. Meanwhile, God has given you people who can walk on their heads for you, but because they're not popular, you don't think that they are important. 
cherish my community. I cherish every association God has blessed me with. In fact, I don't want people to be around me just because I'm known or because I have money or because they think that, you know, and all that. I want them to be around me just because we love each other. Love is the greatest bond we can ever have. Love. And when you have a community of people, I thank God for the people I know here, those who are, you know, connected and all that. I bless God. And that's why we will pray for each other that we will not fall into the fall in the day of temptation. We will not be instruments of unrighteousness in the name of Jesus because it can be painful, but God is good and God is just. Now, number three reason why people are easily offended is because you want to hear it. Number one, I said what? They overrate themselves. Number two, they overrate people. Number three, they underrate God. They underrate God. I'll still read first John chapter two before I close tonight, um, this morning. They underrate God. What do you mean, pastor, by the underrate God? Now, remember that John the Baptist was the one who welcomed Jesus announced Jesus, rather, the Lord Jesus um, to the world. But when John the Baptist was thrown into prison, the Bible tells us that John sent his disciples to go and ask Jesus, <laughs> say, Sir, are you the one we are waiting for? Because I don't understand why I'm in prison. The Savior and the Master. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. It is good to remain humble because God will always find a way to humble you. No matter how center you are at the will of God, there are some things you may be left out in. No matter how, how deep, and that's why God is God. One of the things, the reason why God will probably leave you out in some revelations, some things, and so on and so forth, is not because you are not important, but sometimes so that you can value collaboration. Imagine that it was John that, that announced Jesus. He actually saw the Holy Ghost come on Jesus. But when he was thrown into prison, he, went, he sent them to the Lord Jesus and said, ask that man, is it the one that we are waiting for? Because I don't understand why I'm in prison. I'm paraphrasing. Look at what Jesus said. Jesus said, I'm going to just summarize that. He said, go and tell him that the blind see, the lame walk. John, it's not about you alone. The blind see the lame walk. I celebrate you. In fact, Jesus first celebrated John the Baptist, telling us about how great the man is. And then he went on to say, don't be offended in me. Meaning that John was probably waiting for Jesus to do something spectacular and miraculous about, you know, his situation. And many people, listen to me, are offended. You know, it's amazing. There are two kinds of, there are two targets of offense. Sometimes it's either to man, toward man, and, and sadly toward God. And this is for someone here. You are disappointed that God did not do a particular thing the way you want it to be done. And now you have quit praying, you have quit sowing seeds, you have quit giving, you have quit, you know, touch. Because you say those church people say you are offended that God, after all your service year, your years of service, you do not still have that miracle. You underrate God. You underrate God. You are offended because you underrate God. You have taken God as a man. You think God is your mate. You know, you've had all, see, all these Gen Z songs about God, you know, how that, you know, God is all that, blah, blah, blah. Listen to me. Jesus is not, he's not your baby, oh. He's not your baby. He's not your boyfriend. Jesus is master. The Lord Jesus is Lord. You know, before you even hug him, when you see him, I'm sure you first bow down. We will all bow down, like, we will tremble because he's Lord. He's the majesty of the universe. He's the master of all. He's the alpha and the omega. So when we are disappointed in life situations, we easily are offended sometimes because we are offended at God. Why did this happen to me? You underrate God. You underrate the master. The master has a plan. 
So it's called the master plan. You know, he's called the, yes, yes, Pastor Missy. He doesn't just pamper all the way the pamper. He also scolds. He will put you in seasons of your life. He will look as, oh, you are left out, but you are not left out. God wants you to come to a place where you are not easily offended at him. You don't understand how you'll be offended at the master. You come to a place where you understand that whatever is done by God is on. That in him is light and there's no darkness at all. Have you ever come to a place that Jesus is seen as Lord, not just lover? I like that, Pastor He is Lord of my life. He is Lord of my soul. Yes, I pray for this thing, but I have not yet seen results. Yes, Lord. I made declarations, but I have not yet seen results. Yes, Lord. I have, I have fasted, but I have not yet seen results. Yes, Lord. Knowing that he has a greater plan. John the Baptist was eventually beheaded. Beheaded not because God hated him. God did not even orchestrate the beheading. That God was not, he's not the author of evil. But God allowed it. Because in every opposition to his children, there is a greater good. Trust God. used to be walking in love and hell's trust in God. If the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart, it means that you can now trust God. So people walk in offense because they underrate God. They think, you know, they think sometimes low of God. Please, repent of that. Repent of that. Raise up, dust your Bible again and go back to the place of fellowship because the devil wants to, he wants to save you. He wants to have your soul. He underrates God. He underrates God. You've been trusting God to get married. You fasted, you prayed last year. You fasted, you prayed this year. Listen to me. Some of you, the answer to that situation is to come to a place after you have fasted, right? You are prayed, right? God has given you a promise move past it. Live in such a way that your life is beyond that. Live in such a way that you are telling God that I trust you that this thing will come to pass at your time. Don't underrate God. Underrate God. Don't think that because it didn't come out or turn out the way you thought it would turn out, then God is not good. No. So people are offended because they underrate God. It's our time. I want to move on. Number four, people are offended you want to hear this one? It will shock you. Because they underrate the devil. <laughs> they are offended because they underrate the devil. I will explain to you what that means. The Bible says, do not be ignorant of the devices of the devil. Meaning the devil should not be underrated. Now, do underrate God in his talking about, I'm talking about, do not think low of God. Do not, do not, do not stop reverencing God. Underrated the devil means do not be ignorant of his plans. So some people have, you know, you find out that XYZ begins to act funny. Instead of you to go to the place of prayer, you are, you are talking about it. You are making posts about it. You are fighting the person. You are underrating the devil. Jesus himself did not underrate the devil. The fact is that the Lord Jesus, he saw he saw the apostle, he saw Peter. He saw Peter. He saw an apostle in Peter. But Peter was a very unstable person. He saw an apostle in him. Some of you listen to me. You have thrown away your destiny partners, destiny men, destiny people in your life because you saw them after the flesh. Satan targets the point men in your life. That's why you have to be prayerful. And not underrate the devil. I'm not saying you have to magnify the you, you can't magnify the devil. Who is he? But you don't underrate him. Meaning that you do not leave loopholes. You don't leave open and spaces to him. So Jesus said, Satan has desired you. He wants you, Peter. But I have prayed for you. It is easier to walk in love when you live a life of prayer. And it's interesting, listen to me, it's possible to live a life of prayer and not walk in love. 
because to walk in love, you have to be intentional. And we are going to pray about it tonight and um, this morning. I'm going to pray a particular scripture with you. And I'm trusting God for the walking of the Holy Ghost in you because there is a walking of the Spirit inside you that can leave you, lift you to the next level of your love walk. But of us who are going somewhere to make a statement for God will be faced with the temptation of offense and we can't afford to fail there. So Jesus said, this, uh, he has desired to speak to you, but I pray for you. Don't underrate the devil. Amen. Back to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. I won't know how many minutes I, I, I have left, please. And you let me know so that I can, you know, begin to close the meeting for, you know, the day. So, 1 John chapter 2. Please let me know how many minutes, Um, maybe personally. 1 John chapter 2. And, um, all right, praise God. Thank you so much. Verse 11. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Your sins are forgiven. Look at what he's telling you. Your sins are forgiven, so forgive the sins of others. Your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I have a few more minutes to admonish you, Father, that you have now received the nature of God in you Go and forgive people. Go and show people love. Let me read a scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13. And um, these are real life stuff. These are real life stuff. Listen, how much do you walk in love? Like, like the Lord Jesus who everybody was equal to him. He didn't prioritize anybody because they gave him money over another. Everybody was equal to Jesus. He loved everybody. To love is to place value on something. To love is to place value on something. Hallelujah. Now, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, If I speak in tongues of human beings and of angels, but I don't love, I am a clanging gong or a clashing symbol meaning it is love that gives melody to your tongues it is love that gives it is the love in your heart your love walk makes your your spiritual life a fragrance god wants to perceive so imagine blasting in tongue that's why it's an irony to be praying in tongues to kill your death, your enemy. I'm not saying that your enemies, God knows what to do with them. Are you following me here? But we cannot be praying and speaking in tongues and not walk in love. He says that you are nothing but a clanging gong or a clashing cymbal. Have you heard a clanging gong or clashing cymbal before? What he's saying simply is like I'm making noise. Think about it. If I pray in tongues but I'm not walking in love, I'm not making noise. God forbid. If I have the gift of prophecy, I know all mysteries and everything else. If I don't, if I have such complete faith, if I know everything and I have such complete faith that I can move mountains but I don't love, I have nothing. If I can tell you the depths of Christ, teach you about, you can't even really know the depths of Christ without walking in love. But if I can teach you about the seventh heaven, the eighth heaven, I can teach you about angels and demons and how angels appeared to me in the room and they came with 50, 50 wings and weather and, and feathers. I could see the gold in, in their eyes and all that. And I can teach it, articulate it. I can talk about faith. I can move mountains. I tell you how I built a five billion sitter auditorium and I'm telling you all the things about my trips to the nations and tell you about how I bought a new car and all that by faith but I'm not walking in love the bible says I am nothing meaning love is a substance you are just as weighty as your love walk your weight in the spirit is measured by your depth of love you are nothing if you don't walk in love he didn't say you may He's talking to Christians, so this is not God forbidding. I'm the righteousness of God. You can be God forbidding yourself. 
Jesus, the Bible tells us that if you do not, if you can do more things but don't walk in love, you are nothing. You are as witty, your substance. You see, a day of reckoning is coming. You are going to stand before Jesus. And one of the things you will be judged by is your love work. For God is not unrighteous, he says, to for you, you to amaze you that in a local church, that chief or that usher, that little guy, by least what I mean, maybe stature of frame, I'm not talking about in value. You will brush aside. He cannot even articulate himself well. Not because he's nobody, but because you know he doesn't have the privilege that you have. He might be more, he might be weightier in the spirit than the person who holds the microphone. Because God doesn't weigh by the, the, the exploits that we do. The greatest exploit you will do that he will weigh you by is overcoming offense every season of your life. God doesn't weigh. The Bible says like man weighs. So, ah, that guy you see his exploits of faith. Thank God for the exploits of faith. What about the exploits of love? The, 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 the opportunity to have to crucify somebody and you did not. To call down an angel to slice his neck and you did not. The opportunity you had, they brought something to your table and you could have said, you could have said to hell with him and you did not. God is marking all those things. And the day of reckoning when God will give the crown will come and you will be amazed that some people who did not do as much exploit as you thought should have been done will receive certain crowns because to God, we are not just weighed by our exploits. We are weighed by our love work. Now, he says, if I give him that I have and I have over my body to feel good about what I've done, if I'm a philanthropist and I do selfie as I give peace and beans and I don't walk in love, he says, I receive no benefits whatsoever, meaning Love is the guarantee for reward. If you walk in love, you will receive the right reward. If you don't walk in love, the Bible tells you that if you do all these things for showmanship, your applaud is your... Imagine doing exploits in nations only for people to clap for you and that clap is your reward because you did not walk in love. Have you ever been invited somewhere to minister before? I want to just share this, to minister before. And... You are not even celebrated the way you <laughs> celebrated every other person. Not because you are nobody. But in somehow, somehow, they just intentionally wanted to wash you. Then Hagen talked about going to minister for someone at somebody's house, a uh, ministry. I'm going to wrap it up now. And then the person um, did not even give him food. Just put him in the personage, the lodge there. No food, no nothing. Papa Higgins said that, that was a trying time for he and his wife. He preached, and when he was done, dusted his bag and left. Dusted his shoe and left. So sometimes the opportunity to show love will come like this, and you have to take it. Praise God. Let me end it with this. Ephesians, I'm going to pray, chapter 3, because walking in love is supernatural. You cannot do it in the flesh. You cannot learn how to walk in love without first having the heart of love. You must be enabled to walk in love before you learn to walk in love. Because you cannot walk in love without receiving the empowerment. So Paul prays in Ephesians 3 and verse 16. I ask, let me read Ephesians 3, 16. Um, the KJV version is what, my KJV is my favorite um, translation. Praise God. Excuse me. Let me read the NKG so I don't. Uh, Ephesians chapter 15, chapter 3, verse 15, no, 16 rather. That he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your heart. He says, I pray that the Holy Spirit will strengthen you in your inner man for two reasons. 
Listen, sir. Listen, man. For two reasons. Ephesians 3, 16 was written for two reasons. He prayed that God will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened in your inner man for two reasons. Number one, that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. What does it mean by Christ dwelling in your heart by faith? It means that, number one, the message of Jesus will remain in your heart because Jesus dwells in your heart already. So he's talking about the message. And number two, that you be rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ who passeth knowledge. But you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Meaning that there are specks of God your life can never display until you are filled with the food, until rather you are rooted and grounded in love. Love, God can entrust you with so much, but without the pulsating power of loving you, there are some things that will be withheld from you. We are going to pray right now, and I'm going to just make that declaration that I, Lord, that you fill us, cause us to be strengthened with might in our spirit, in your spirit, in our inner man, that Lord, we will be rooted and grounded in love so that we can comprehend together the dimensions of your love. Everywhere we go, we are able to live above offense, live above every tripping thing, live above the snares of the fowler, and anyone who is held in captivity to offense like yours, like you did, Lord Jesus, help us forgive. Help us forgive. Help us let go so that your name will be glorified and you can use the situation for your good. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Thank you for having me today, Pastor Emisi, Pastor Olumide, and all the members of IRA. Thank you. I love you. I'll be here tomorrow. Thank you so much, Pastor Dami. Wow, what a word. I even love the way you put that. I'm good I see that is in me. A lot of time when we talk about that, we're talking about power things as against character. This is such a powerful word that we all must listen to over and over. Thank you so much. We're looking forward to tomorrow. And we trust that by God's grace, we're going to have a great time in God's presence. God bless you. God bless you all for joining. See you all tomorrow. Thank you, Pastor Dami. God bless you.